Good afternoon, colleagues. Welcome to today's Liverpool City Region Combined Authority with Mike's Mics. Um, can all phones be turned off, please, as normal? And can I remind members and presenters to use the microphones when they do present? Um, it is the third button along that you press, and the little red light will come on. And it says you work best when you are close to them, but I think these pick up much better than the previous um, microphones that we had. Um, just before the start, we have had um, notice of a resignation of one of our deputy uh, portfolio holders, uh, Jill Neal, who's uh, unfortunately uh, told Phil that she can't continue with the portfolio support because of uh, the pressures that she has uh, elsewhere. So. Um, Phil will be in the process of recruiting for that vacancy in the very near future. Um, are there apologies for absence? I've received apologies from Councillor O'Neill, Gideon Ben Tobin, Councillor Powell, Professor Dame Janet Beer, Luciana Berger, Asif Hamid, Jane Kennedy, Councillor Emily Spurrell, Councillor Nicholas, and that's it. Any further apologies? Okay, two is for leaders and, and the mayor, uh, declarations of interest. Three is the minutes of the previous meeting uh, of the combined authority held on the 19th of October 2018, which are included in pages 1 to 12. Uh, can I ask that they are agreed, please? Agreed. Item four is um, some updates from last month. And, um, last week it was on the Friday, um, on behalf of the command authority and the Six authority leaders. I formally launched our new strategic investment fund, which is a new half a billion pound investment to help transform our economy, create those high quality, high value jobs, high skilled jobs, and to boost the living standards for people across the city region. And while investment on this scale is always exciting in itself, I think myself and the other leaders uh, want the Liverpool City region to do things differently, which is why we're going to prioritise bids that come in for this half a billion pound fund that demonstrate that they will have a positive social impact <coughs> and promote our inclusive growth aspirations. So if I put this simply, it means that in the organisation who wants some of our money from the combined authority will be prioritised if they fulfil criteria which includes using local labour, paying a real living wage, recognising trade unions, offering apprenticeships and supporting underrepresented groups. And that also of course includes supply chains uh, on the early points. And I truly believe that uh, that strategic investment fund will set the bar nationally uh, and it builds on what our local <coughs> authorities are already achieving um, with their own inclusive growth strategies, but it just shows you that devolution can really deliver benefits for everyone in the city region. Uh, last month, both myself and Mayor Anderson uh, were in Bristol for the Global Parliament of Mayors. It was a gathering of 80 mayors from around the world, uh, and as part of that two day event, I joined the other metro mayors um, from the other city regions, so the city Khan and seven others to discuss how we can best use our collaborative clout to lobby government for further powers and for funding to be devolved away from Westminster to the regions. Myself and Joe also attended a Metro Mayors and Core City Leaders Summit <coughs> where we discussed how Core Cities and the City Regions can work together to tackle common problems like air quality, transport and skills. And uh, I think there's going to be a piece of work that will come out of that um, where we'll start to ensure that that collaboration continues. Uh, moving on to item five, uh, the Appointments and Disciplinary Committee met on the 8th of November to consider the appointment, the position of the LCR uh, Combined Authority Chief Executive. The committee are recommending to the Combined Authority that the current interim head of paid service be appointed to the position LCR Combined Authority Chief Executive. Are there any questions? Um, are the recommendations are set out on page 13 in the report therefore agreed? Six is um, 
about housing first and our funding allocation and Council Long will take us through um, this report. Council Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Christmas uh, uh, always brings into sharp focus uh, the uh, issue of homelessness and uh, so it's right that we're taking this report at this time. Uh, colleagues will recall that in the past uh, there was a central government announcement about funding. Uh, this uh, report uh, accepts the funding to undertake a uh, set of pilots associated with a housing first approach to addressing the challenges of um, resolving problems for people who are, who are homeless. Um, so this agrees to accept 7.7 .7 million housing first funding, um, which will run for a three year period in a phased set of, um, um, of tranches. Um, but also the detail of how we uh, implement the uh, allocation and how the whole system works as a result of this funding uh, will be resolved in conversation with the constituent authorities um, uh, who have statutory housing functions. So <coughs> essentially this is to accept the money at this stage, uh, Mr Mayor, and then um, move forward with a second report in due course to explain how it will be run within the city region. So I move the recommendation of 2.1. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hardy, uh, do you have anything to add? <coughs> Just obviously I welcome this report as well, you do always worry and I think it's very timely, winter is coming and people out on our streets are incredibly vulnerable at this time of year in particular. So I look forward to the implementation of the project, you know this is an opportunity for the city region to do something differently and to demonstrate actually how a labour led authority can really deliver on the homelessness agenda so I welcome it and hope that we can deliver it quickly. Ditto. Um, are there any questions? If not, can we agree the recommendations as set out on page 19? Three. Item 6 is um, tackling poor air, air quality across the city region and we think we all have that the importance of improved air quality. Uh, this report builds upon one of my pledges along with the recommendations arising from the work undertaken by the overview and scrutiny committee last year and there's some, again some best practice that uh, is going on in our uh, city region with the local authorities and this is a local city region footprint uh, approach to what's going on so councillor robinson will take us through the report yeah thanks very much and very much just to echo all those comments that you just made steve because i think we all recognize that air quality is one of the greatest challenges that faces our city region and the citizens of our city region and we're all very 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 conscious of the fact that it has a disproportionate effect on our most vulnerable and deprived communities and citizens. It really is something that I know we all focus on very, very heavily. Obviously, back in June of this year, uh, we received a report from the Scrutiny Committee, which had a number of recommendations in it with regards to the issue of air quality, one of which was the recommendation to establish a city region task force on the issue. So very much uh, with that in mind, that is what we are proposing to do from this paper. I think it gives us a great opportunity very much to recognise some of the excellent work that's already going on at a local authority level. Each of our constituent districts is doing some really good, innovative and excellent stuff. And I think this gives uh, a great conduit to look at how we can roll out some of that best practice right across the region and look at how collectively we can build upon it as well. So I see this as a really, really good sort of strong partnership model hosted by the combined authority but with key representatives from politicians and officers from all of our districts as well as a number of other experts in the field uh, and looking at how we can sort of uh, take this issue further because it's one of our greatest challenges that our citizens depend upon. Um, are, there, are there any questions for um, Liam? Yes, Carla. Uh, it's, not, it's not really a question, it's just a, a, a comment, just to say that I, I welcome this um, particular aspect because I was on the task and finish group on the overview and scrutiny, which um, met about five times um, this year. And we also suggested that the Metro Mayor, on behalf of the combined authority, acts as a political champion for a series of long-term measures to improve air quality across the Liverpool city region, involving a wide range of influential bodies and decision makers. So I absolutely commend this, this 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we do the recommendations there for us? That's on page 25 on the board. Um, item 8 uh, is a portfolio holder update and council date is going to take us to a presentation which highlights some of the key activity within the portfolio area of um, inclusive growth, economic development, digital and innovation. Thanks Steve and uh, truly he's been very kind to do the slides from, from uh, where she is but I'll speak to them. So uh, thanks for giving this giving me this opportunity to just do a very short presentation on the, uh, the areas that fall within uh, my portfolio. I, I need to start off by just saying a big thank you though to Mark Barrisfield and Eric Robinson and the team that, that work with me because they're the guys who do all the hard work so uh, you know I really, really appreciate the, the effort that's been uh, put in and I think um, we've made a lot of progress in the last six months and have an exciting agenda going forward. But just very briefly um, uh, outline the uh, main uh, elements of the, uh, uh, of the portfolio. So uh, we've been working on a, an action plan uh, around nine uh, key objectives, which I'll, I'll just run through in, in, in a moment or two. Um, we do have a, a small uh, team that, that meets monthly. Uh, to uh, look at progress. Uh, we've basically divided the, uh, the activities into uh, getting the, the plans and, and strategies and platforms in place uh, to, to make sense of this portfolio because it is a very wide ranging portfolio with um, a whole range of different strands but more importantly to agree on a on a, on a relatively small number but important set of activities where you know we can actually deliver um, uh, tangible things for the city region and and also where where possible to make sure that we're linking in with the other portfolios because a lot of the the stuff that that, that we do has um, uh, dependencies and links across all of the portfolio holders um, so i think that needs to be borne in mind um, and really the activities, the core of the activities are, are around the, the kind of economic development brief uh, focus on the new um, strategic investment fund um, but also kind of laced through all, all of this work is, is the kind of whole inclusive growth um, agenda which um, is, is I think an absolutely critical uh, priority for, for, the, for the combined authority and I'll say more about that in, in a minute. Thanks Trudy. Okay, so uh, just uh, very briefly the, the, the nine main areas that we've been working on. So the first one is the overall investment strategy. Uh, Steve, you, you, you launched that last week and, and um, I think that's a, a really uh, exciting opportunity to to bring back some important investments in the, in the city region um, uh, and not just look at the SIF but how other pots of money can link into the strategic investment fund. Uh, so that's been a key uh, area of work. The one front door, the, the, the concept of having a much more efficient and focused um, uh, uh, conduit into the combined authority for um, inward investment and for businesses. And, and clearly, you know, you launched that at uh, MIPIN UK uh, last month. Um, we've been working obviously with Mark Basnett and the team at the LEP on the internationalisation strategy. Uh, that's now been completed so I think the next phase of that is the action plan and making sure we deliver that and that obviously uh, absolutely links into the one front door uh, concept and um, I, I think that uh, uh, that's got an exciting piece of work and also the, we're doing a review of current business growth offer which we'll have completed by the end of this year. The third area is local industrial strategy so this is um, obviously responding to the opportunities uh, created by the government's um, industrial strategy but having a uh, clearly defined plan of our own for key growth sectors um, the, the work that's been done again through, through Mark at the LEP uh, is, is around data collection and analysis and uh, we're moving to a situation where hopefully by um, the early part of next year we should be in a, in a position to produce a, a draft strategy to bring back to the, 
to the LEC and the CA, and, and, and I understand that we've been given a little, a little more time from government to produce our own local in, uh, industrial strategy, but I think we can bring something back to this, this body um, in, in early in, in 2019. Thanks, Trudy. Um, fourth area, I mentioned the, the launch of the SIF Round 2. Um, I won't kind of repeat the, the key messages, Steve, you, you gave last week at that launch, but it, I think it's about being a lot more focused about how we do, um, we, we invest the SIF, making sure that we leave it in other opportunities alongside the SIF, um, and also making sure that there's a return into the fund uh, so it can be recycled for future rounds. And then obviously making sure that any under commitment from round one um, is, is spent and delivered so that um, you know, we can we make sure we spend every penny of the money. Uh, next area is the town centres programme. So obviously, Steve, you made the announcement um, a couple of months ago now around the million pounds allocation uh, for the boroughs. Uh, our, our team at the CA are working with colleagues in each of the local authorities around making sure that money is, um, is, is distributed effectively. And also linking in to the announcement the Chancellor made in the uh, the budget around a national town centre funding. I think from memory it's about 600 million. Um, so we need to make sure that we get our, our fair share of that money. So we're trying to link those two things um, together. Uh, a couple of areas now around the, I mentioned the inclusive growth being the kind of golden thread that, that flows through a lot of this portfolio. But we really want to kind of look at um, how we can take that agenda forward. There's, some fantastic work going on in each of the local authorities, um, and we need to um, learn from that and bring that and bring that forward. We're looking at doing some workshops in January and February of next year uh, around best practice um, in the uh, in the borough, so we can uh, we can all learn from and replicate. And that links in, thanks Trudy, to the <clears throat> the next area, which is we call the audit of the public purse. And effectively, this is. Uh, the, the work that's going on around um, how we ensure that the, the substantial funding that not just local authorities but other public sector bodies spend in the city region as far as possible we can make sure that benefits local people, local residents and local businesses. Um, there's, there's a lot of work going on nationally around this uh, and, and it often goes under the heading of community wealth building and um, areas like Preston are doing a lot of work. I actually think we're doing at least as much, if not more, than Preston is doing, and we need to kind of show, showcase that. But that will <clears throat> that will be part of the, the workshops we do in the first part of next year. And then the next area is a whole around the whole digital agenda. So we're looking at um, do, doing the uh, putting together a, a uh, plan which uh, includes developing full fiber network. Um, throughout the city region. This is very much being led by John Whaling from the LEP who's done sterling work in this area. So we've got a business plan uh, now in place. Um, we, will try, we will produce a commercial plan by the end of this year and we're looking at a major launch at MIPIN in March of next year. And just as an aside, I, um, I attended the Digital Summit last week um, in, in Liverpool and that was just a fantastic showcase for some wonderful companies that are doing literally sort of state of the art work in, in digital and creative. And uh, you know, we are really at the forefront of, of many of these technologies like AI, um, etc. And we probably don't shout it out enough about, about this because um, these are multi million pound companies, a lot of them, and are growing at a rapid rate. So, uh, that gave me real kind of heart that, that we've got a sector there that, that the Liverpool City region is absolutely um, not just a, a local leader but a, a national and international leader. So that was that was really impressive. And then finally, um, we're looking at the whole agenda around how can we make sure that the kind of academic uh, excellence that we have within our, particularly our universities, um, can be translated into kind of business and commercial propositions because we've got again some uh, really leading edge um, research and development going on in our higher education institutions. Um, I'm not convinced that we maximise the opportunities for translating that into 
creating new businesses and jobs and uh, investment. So we're, we're looking at um, uh, how we can uh, work with our universities and some of our businesses. And we're looking at also things, Joe, like the Knowledge Quarter, which is a fantastic initiative in Liverpool. And we've been speaking to, to Colin about how we can make sure we, we actually um, capture that excellent R&D expertise we've got in our in our higher education, in our universities, uh, for the benefit of, of, of creating businesses that will bring jobs and investment to uh, to the city region. So, uh, final final slide, just to say, um, this, I've just sort of really summarised very quickly the, the kind of main areas of the of the portfolio. Um, we we do have regular meetings with portfolio holders. Um, in the other boroughs in this, in this area around economic development, inclusive growth. Uh, but I think it's a very exciting agenda and I think it's something that um, hopefully uh, there can be lots of really positive announcements on um, in the next 12 months. That's it. Thanks, Luke. Fantastic um, presentation. And it just demonstrates, doesn't it, um, how much is being done in just a short space of time. And it's a pity that um, that wasn't able to be streamed or whatever film which we won't be looking at uh, because I think the more people who understand just how much we are doing the more they'll get and, and appreciate if you like why you as six leaders took the, uh, the leap of faith to sign a devolution agreement in November 2015 it, it really is paying dividends so um, as well as you I'd like to congratulate the officers that you, you mentioned um, are there any questions for Phil Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'd just like to also endorse the, 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 the congratulations to Councillor Davis on the work that he and, and colleagues have done uh, on a, such a diverse portfolio as well. Um, from, from St Helens' point of view, uh, we welcome the comments on town centres. Uh, we are well advanced with our work with St Helens, to transform St Helens town centre itself and some of our, some of our other district centres. And, we will look to engage with that uh, the work that you've started already. So that's very encouraging, very exciting. Just make an observation about the digital engagement. Uh, uh, myself and yourself uh, were, were at a, a private and Health business award uh, uh, yesterday, Mr. Mayor. And um, uh, at that, I had the privilege to meet a number of excellent businesses, uh, one of which was a, a small uh, startup business, which has been going for a little while now which provides surgical simulation uh, uh, techniques to, to train uh, uh, doctors as they go through the process of becoming surgeons. And fantastically uh, detailed and really challenging uh, uh, issues that they've overcome in order to become a firm that uh, exports to 48 different countries. Um, and uh, the significance, therefore, of a full fiber network across the city region and the implications of actually maybe other product development for that organisation or any of us, real opportunities for, for them to grow if they can connect to the, with, the, with this um, the, the, the broadband, the, the ultra fast broadband that we talk about many years. So um, I think really encouraging and uh, more than that, you're Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask whether the slides could be shared uh, in order that we can take that information back. It was a lot of detail in there and it would be really good to be able to talk that through with members and also with um, residents. So I think we should have that around. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask the Anthony to take care of any other questions for Phil. Okay, um, we'll move on. Uh, item 9 is High Street 2 and Northern Powers <coughs> Rail update. Um, <coughs> We're not asking Liam to go through all 232 pages individually, um, but it is about the way it has been conducted by Transport for the North, which, of course, we are a member of. Um, Liam? Yeah, thanks very much. And obviously, Liverpool City Region has been a founding member of Transport for the North, going back all the way to 2014, when we commissioned the One North Report, which was very much the kind of precursor to Transport for the North. Um, as well as being a founder member, we've been one of the most prominent and deeply engaged uh, areas in the work of TFN and as the, the report suggests there's a number of different 
work streams that TFN uh, leads on. Things like, for example, integrated and smart ticketing right across the north of England. <laughs> a lot of the learning and the successes from the Walrus card here in the Liverpool City region, we're using those lessons to kind of see how we can roll out smart ticketing across the rest of the north as well as supporting on our local rail network here, particularly with Mersey Rail. Equally as well, I point to a lot of the detailed work that's been done with regard to freight through transport for the north. Um, we know just how important the movement of goods and freight is to our region, particularly when we think about the port of Liverpool and the growth of the port, but also the importance of a number of key locations for the logistics and supply industry in our area. So lots of detailed work that we've been involved in within Transport for the North. But obviously the key flagship project for Transport for the North is what is known as Northern Powerhouse Rail, or those of us uh, who prefer Labour Party parlance prefer to call Crossrail for the North, that kind of brand new West East Railway, uh, pulling the North together as one, thinking about how we have a step change in our connectivity, both for the movement of passengers, but just as important with the movement of goods and freight. Obviously, as a city region, we've always been strong and prominent supporters of HS2. However, we've always been uh, keen to point out that the current classic compatible um, proposal for the city region for HS2, whilst an improvement, does not give us the significant step change in connectivity that will be benefited by other parts of the UK and other parts of the North. So we've always focused on how can we improve our north-south connections, but also our west-east connections. And we strongly believe that Northern Powerhouse Rail is the key means to do that. That brand new railway proposition from Liverpool going out towards <coughs> HS2, so it will give us the connection onto the HS2 network to give us uh, fast journeys north-south to London, but also having the ability to use the as planned HS2 infrastructure for fast journeys east into Manchester and then a number of other associated new pieces of rail infrastructure east of Manchester can give us further fast journeys onto um, cities such as Leeds, Sheffield and Newcastle. So we believe it can give us a real step change in passenger journeys across the north but actually we would argue even more important than those fast passenger journeys and additional passenger capacity is the fact that Northern Powerhouse Rail will be able to free up lots of capacity on the conventional rail network for the movement of goods and freight and that is absolutely vital for the success of the port, the success of our area and the success of the north and the rebalancing of the British economy. Obviously uh, we know that the kind of transport proposition alone we believe is extremely compelling but when you start to look at the kind of economic impact, it is huge. And that's why actually the majority of the 201 pages of this report is the appendix, uh, the appendix of the independent, and I stress the word independent, economic uh, report that we did in terms of the economic benefit that a full high-speed connection, north, south, east, west, can bring to the city region and the UK economy as a whole. And the headline we would point out is once we've run that model, it is predicted to, benefit, uh, to generate a £15 billion pound of economic growth for our region and beyond. And when you think about the, the price of delivering this would be in the low buildings, then quite frankly it's an economic brainer, not just for our area, but for the whole of the United Kingdom. There's lots of detailed work that ourselves within Transport for the North have been doing. There's still a lot more that we need to do, but I think we're in a very, very strong position to make sure we continue to press this case and we will not rest until it is fully developed, delivered, constructed and in operation. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Uh, are there any questions for Councillor Robertson? Joe? Yeah, just, just relevant in terms of the, the news that's been announced uh, today, that uh, the decision about uh, building a link from the port through Grimmel's Valley Park has been, uh, if you like, agreed. Can, can we, uh, given the fact that we know that uh, we will get an increase in terms of capacity, uh, whatever happens with HS2, and given the amount of money that we're going to be spending on the new road link anyway, can we not see, given that we're getting billions of pounds in addition to the HS2 spend, spent on new stations in Birmingham, in Leeds, in Manchester, 
we're not lobbying government to say that, you know, look, before we make any commitments or, or, or whatever of sort of this, we need a commitment off you that we would consider, for instance, an underground route from the port to Liverpool to the Longsway network. That, that stops, we're talking about congestion, we're talking about air quality, we're talking about all the things that we've just discussed here. And yet it's the biggest challenge that faces us because the four, there's going to be a 400% increase in containers coming out of the port of Liverpool. We know that. That's a fact. That's people's aspirations. And we welcome that. We want that to happen. But at the same time, we can't have numbers <coughs> of, of, of containers coming out of the port that's going to gridlock our, our motorway networks and, and, and indeed, and indeed you know, all of the road networks lead now to Seth and then also coming through to Liverpool to the M62. So it's an important challenge for us and I think we should not give up on that. This judgment being built to, to me because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think the better option is to build a link underneath the Rim Road Valley, underneath the roads that takes us directly onto the motorway. And that can easily be done. In this day and age, that can easily be done. We've got that type of technology available in China, in Europe, and we can import it and use it here. So Peel needs to be got round the table, uh, and also the government, uh, Steve, to actually convince them that we mean business when we talk about looking at alternative options just to build and plough and right through what is a, a, a valuable asset in Sefton. And I just think we need to do that very, very strongly. I will bring Council Mayor in. Um, it, just to clarify a point, the judicial review was unsuccessful. It doesn't automatically mean that there may not be further legal action taken by Sefton, and therefore the road isn't, there's no work starting on the road. Um, but you're right, Joe, the, the option um, that we would prefer is a tunnel option or a cut and cover at worst. And um, we think that that would gain widespread support. Um, the problem that the government have said is that the business case doesn't stack up. Um, Council Mayor. Thanks Steve. Yeah, the announcement today on the decision that our attempt at a disc review to have Highway of England reconsider their options, their options and their, their consultation methods has been announced that that's been unsuccessful today. Now, you're absolutely right that that isn't the end of the road, if you'll excuse the pun, as far as Sefton is concerned. Because this is, notwithstanding the economic things that Joe's just been talking about, of course, we look early in our agenda and we have to think about the air quality. And the air quality in, in, in South Sefton in general and in the, in the areas around the Dunn Bridge Corridor and, of course, the Crosby Access to and from Liverpool, to and from that corridor, is extremely poor, and extremely poor. Um, we, we, we know that I'm a boot lad born and bred, full instance chair, and I can expect to live 15 years less than someone elsewhere in, in our borough. And that much of that is because of those traditional activities from the port, I'm not being critical there. Um, and the air quality in, in modern days of, of, of transport going up and down that particular corridor. It's an important issue in, in that way. That has to be dealt with because of the the extra containers that are coming come in post Panamax and the new super container ships that, that people have prepared for to, to accept and are starting, I understand, to, to, to come our way. Now, also in amongst that, we <coughs> have a, a urban sprawl in South Sefton and Rimrose Valley, if people don't know, is the is, is our urban is our urban country park. And and so that's our green lungs um, to try and combat what's going on next door, so to speak, with with what's happening as we speak on, on the Dunnage Bridge and Chairs Road corridor. So that's an issue as well. Also the the, the road as proposed um, also splits the communities as well because at the moment you can walk from one side of the valley to another and you go right across and, and, and our communities merge there and, and get on well together and, and that. so that will go as well and we've what we've said is that we believe that we believe that the the consultation 
it, it's, it's, it's wrong from, from early consultation what they said they would do and we, we, we firmly believe that but the, the judge has also said that the, the finance involved in this is a political and this goes to the, the rub of it now it's a political and not a judicial point and what's happened Steve, what's happened here is, is quite simple some time ago George Osborne announced a, a, a financial envelope for a, a road improvement leading from, from Moodle Docks because of the impact of what we've just been saying about the post Panamax and the implications of that. But that window was a, a relatively small amount, some £250 million. Now, you could say that that ties Highways England's hands and they have to cut that suit to that particular cloth. So they've got £250 million to spend. How can they spend that £250 million? And some people might say, well, that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Right. But actually, what should have happened is that, is that Highways England should have scoped all this out and then gone to government with, with figures. So instead of, a, instead of a, a, an envelope coming from, from the Chancellor, it should have been, here's what's needed. Now, the economic, the economic argument is what it is. But increasingly, and we as, we as Certainly as local authorities now, you know, what we've said before about air quality, we have statutory duties here on, on air quality and protecting the health of our people. And that must be taken into account. Unfortunately, governments prefer to spend billions and billions of pounds building tunnels under, under Stonehenge at some two billion pounds. And, and I think uh, Chris Grayling at the time said it would help, it would help the air quality of local residents. And I'm absolutely certain that those sheep will appreciate that. <coughs> sure. And another one from, from in, in Kent, around the Dartford Tunnel area, has, has recently been announced of, of, of many billions of pounds to do that there. And why can't we have that here? Probably because we're in the north. That's what it's all about. So it's absolutely right that we press government and say, there's, there's more to this than meets the eye. You know, we need a long-term solution here. We need a proper solution that, that fits all of the criteria, including the economic benefits that may have, that will be coming from, from the expansion, but also the quality of life of local residents and, and the air qualities that, that need to be sorted out. And also, I mean, how is England's record of maintaining the existing road corridor of Stone Bridge and Chairs Road is abysmal. That's one of the major routes into our city region at the end of two motorways. And when you when you come off that through Switch Island, it, it's the, the, the picture in front of it is awful. Highways England can't even maintain the roads. That's their road, by the way. It's not Sefton Council's. Highways England can't even maintain that road. So when they've got two major roads, i.e. the corridor and their new road, if that's where it ends up, it's, it's going to be just as bad. More needs to be done. I appreciate the comments from from Joe, we will, uh, I, I will be talking to our officers, I'll be seeking further legal advice, because I certainly don't believe that this is the end of our journey in, in protecting the health of our people within South Sefton. Chair, can I just come back on, on, on a couple of things? I, I, I think first, don't disassociate myself with the tax on the sheep and get. It's, uh, not, 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 not. Uh, sec secondly, though, more importantly, I think when we look at this in, in, in a serious uh, way, we see, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, that everyone's laughing because I mentioned the sheep, which went over your head, bar, bar, bar one. But the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, we have uh, a business case being quoted back at us in terms of that it doesn't stack up. Well, uh, it's absolutely nonsense that, that they can claim that, you know, there's arguments about whether the business case stacks up for HS2 whether it's stacked up for Crossrail 1, 2, 3, where we're up to now, Crossrail 11. But the fact of the matter is, it, 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 you can argue that. But it's okay for Peel, for instance, and I'm not attacking Peel, I'm just actually making the point here, that we've made a £350 million investment in new cranes in, in, in a superport that's going to increase the volume of containers. Fantastic. Puts the superport out there, all great, all fantastic. The reality is, when we talk about a business case, we're talking about you know future investments in infrastructure uh, by the UK government. And if we look at that in terms of what Highways England themselves should know, 
with that volume of increase in traffic, then there is going to be gridlock on our motorway network in terms of Dunham's Bridge Road, Miller's Bridge into Liverpool or through Crosby to get out of, of the port. That, that, is, that is as clear as, as, as the, the road's on the end of your face. It's going to happen. So what do we do? We've got all the issues about, about air quality and stuff too. So is there a way that, that we can resolve it and solve it? Well, there is. Because at the end of the day, one of the reasons why that container berth was built was because there was a clear understanding as the post Panama and Panama Canal was widened to take in the biggest container ships in the world, that being the port of Liverpool on the west side of the UK was going to mean that we would benefit from that hugely because of the drop off from the, the, the Canada, from the Americas and, and from the Far East coming through in, into the West Coast. So we know that people are going to benefit from that. We know that the, the people who are delivering those containers to the UK are going to benefit from that. So instead of them being shipped into Felixstowe or Harrods or Dover or the southern ports, they're coming directly into the middle of the country. So shipping them, the vast majority of them, go through to Scotland. So there's a big saving for them. So we have to look at working in a, in a business case way to say that we actually charge for each container, 20 quid for example. If we're then talking about 4 million uh, containers coming in a year, then it, give, it, it adds to your business case about spending to actually change the dynamic of your, your infrastructure spending. You can toll that toll as well. So you can make money as well as using the investment of the 250, we can look at the city region potentially looking at investment with gauge here as well and tolling to get some of the money back in revenue. There's all kinds of permutations and options. What we've got to do is challenge the negative, the false communications that's coming out saying that we need this and we're Luddites if we stop it. That's not the case. We're actually saying that we need it, we need the port, but there is a better way and a more environmentally friendly way and a more sensible way of doing things and that's all we ask and I believe we can put a business case back that says we're Peel because we've got to factor in Peel here they're benefiting, they're benefiting from it the companies that use the pools are benefiting because it's a quicker way for them so we put extra revenue charge on the containers coming in that still makes it cheaper and viable for them to use the pools in Liverpool and then that goes into funding a tunnel or, or a better transport route out of the port than we are. And we should fight back and challenge and tackle the misinformation that's coming out there and not give up. Um, I, I think, Joe, if um, what you're saying is that there's a, a contention that there's a north south divide, I think we all agree with that. Um, we've argued about the methodology that is used for the business case. So the benefit cost ratio, we believe there should be other factors that are included in that, so we've um, made that representation to, to government. The vast majority of traffic on that road is not port related, 82% is not port related, so whether we could, even at 20 pence, 20 pounds a, a, a unit, make that business case stack up, I don't know, but we haven't done the modelling, so we don't know, but I think you're right. It's time that everybody sat around the table now, given that the judicial review has been heard, um, trying to shoehorn this back to High Speed 2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail. It has to be about multimodal solutions, doesn't it? And it has to be about um, connectivity and capacity. And whilst we think the best solution to this is rail connectivity that goes from the port, and right the way across, and I don't know whether Liam referred to the fact that at the moment you can't get west to east without going very, very deep south or very, very deep north. Um, we need that to be sorted out as soon as possible.